So hello and welcome to this SuperOffice Supercharge webinar. We're going to talk about B2B sales and if the B2B sales team is going to survive the future. Of course they will, but it's just a matter of how and uh, in which way are they going to develop. So I'm here today with Brian Andersen from Quadrant. Warm hello. welcome. Nice to be here. Yes, so we're going to spend a few minutes here to chit chat about this. Yeah. Super exciting topic. And uh, just to be super clear from the beginning, uh, this is a pre-recorded session. So the chat function functions, you will get the recording after the webinar, and we will also be participating and picking up questions after the webinar. So uh, warm, warm welcome. And uh, uh, my name is Matthias Sonnefors. I am working with SuperOffice. I'm responsible for our uh, Danish and Swedish market, and there are business there. But I have about 20 odd years in uh, sales management, building, developing, sales teams and uh, want to just share and maybe discuss some of the uh, important topics that we've learned throughout the day and yeah. or throughout the years and uh, see where we go from here. But Brian, uh, first, a few words about yourself. Thank you and hello everyone. So my name is Brian and I'm a partner at the company called Advanced Consulting. Yeah. So we're a very specialized management consulting, only working with B2B sales and marketing. Yeah. So my own background is more from marketing, actually, and then I kind of grew to love sales as well, and particularly uh, this dynamic between more heavy, long deal cycle sales and also mixed up with e-commerce and all of these other things. Yeah. So yeah, we work with large Danish international companies on how to yeah, grow sales uh, with a combination of sales and marketing. Cool. And we, we came across each other and started talking about this exciting topic and uh, uh, thought about maybe how about you know, just recording a session to share yep. some of the knowledge from what I'm consulting and also our, our experience from SuperOffice. So why is why is B2B sales more complex today mm. than, than before? Yeah, so I think there's kind of two things happening, right? One thing is, of course, that if you're a sales guy today, you're kind of pressured from two sides, right? So all of the easy sales you used to do, like the small transactional sales mm -hmm. that just get you going, a lot of those has actually moved to e-commerce, right? So what we typically call transactional selling, it's just better to do yourself, right? Yeah. And we see that in all industries, right? Whether it's med tech or software, or whatever, you do more on your own as a buyer. And then of course, the let's say the more consultative selling is becoming harder, right? It's actually the complex, it's becoming more complex yeah. because there's more people in the buying group. So suddenly there's also finance and procurement and IT and illegal. Mm -hmm. So buying groups are growing. So you have to deal with more stakeholders as a salesperson, which is super difficult. And then the last bit is, of course, that the buyer themselves, they are smarter than ever because of this small phenomenon called the internet. Uh, they are, of course, educating themselves more than ever before. So that's what we see often from our clients that when the sales guy comes into a meeting, often the client actually knows, or potential prospect knows a lot about the industry, the products, and so on. So yeah, pushed from both sides and they're harder than ever to work in sales. Yeah. yeah. And if we're going to frame who are we talking to today? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about B2B sales. Yes. We're not talking about transactional sales that yeah. is you know, through digitally, through yeah, the yeah. web automatically. We're talking about more complex consultative sales maybe. Yes. Yeah, yeah, where maybe a company has a product and a service. Uh, sales cycles are a little bit longer, mm -hmm. a little bit longer than we talk about maybe months. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, as, as also said, it's, a different kind of value that's being that need to be delivered and perceived yeah. from the from the uh, from the customer side. Exactly, and I think it was never easy being in sales, but it's no. just getting harder and harder and harder because of these things. Right? Yeah. So what what has how do you see what has happened within the sales organization? How when you look at different different companies, we SuperOffice we help companies on a daily basis mm -hmm. uh, with B two B sales and providing a platform for them to work better. We're not really going to talk about too much about that currently, but yeah. uh, what do you see from your perspective uh, in, in organizations today? How they develop and uh, let's say yeah. follow the follow the flow with the with the challenges and opportunities. I think if you walked into most sales teams even just five years ago, they would look more or less like this: that everyone was kind of the same, let's say, level of seller, and they were typically divided into territories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do uh, east of Denmark, you do west of Denmark, yeah. and I have a company car, you have a company car, and we ride around, right, and visit customers, and then we hire someone in south of Sweden, and then we expand like that. 
And that was kind of the, let's say, that's how you organized sales, right? Because a lot of the interactions were physical, to be honest, right? So this kind of territory, everyone is the same sales organization has probably been the most prevalent way of organizing sales. And then I think, of course, kickstarted by COVID, but was underway before that was actually people looking at sales in a different way that, hey, if it is getting more complex, there's more buyers, we need to be more specialized as sellers, we probably need to organize differently. And that can be many different ways. It can be, could be verticals, right? Let's say we have a hospital expert if we're selling to hospitals versus a, I don't know, a public sector expert, anything where you kind of you put more knowledge into each salesperson and make them more specialized and deeper. It could be a different way of organizing sales, right? So you go from this, let's say, a team of sellers where they're all kind of the same to a team that sells, right? Where different yeah. people in the sales team have different roles, but they might be working on the same customer. I think that's the story. I think broadly specialization and away from this traveling territory salesman. I think that's probably the, the biggest change that's happening. Right now. Yeah. So it's more, if you put together a team, it's more like you really need to look at the capabilities, the mm -hmm. attitude, the, the personal characteristics yeah. of each individual and how they serve the purpose of actually selling. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm actually curious how you guys work with that because you know, we tend to bucket sales into, yeah, here's a salesperson. And everyone has this mental idea of, yeah, that lone wolf, you know, mm -hmm. very uh, charismatic, going out, closing deals. But at least in my experience, that's not how most salespeople actually are. They can be many different types of salespeople. So how do you kind of put that team together? Yeah, if you, if you look at SuperOffice, and I think we represent, we have a product, we have services, we are working with mature companies that mm. are uh, fairly process driven and so forth. So we, the way we work kind of represent also our target audience yeah. uh, in, in, in many ways. And for us, teaming, uh, selling is a team sport. Mm. Absolutely. And the, what we see today is that it's becoming, if we're looking at new customer sales, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot more around marketing collaboration with sales. So yeah. sales need to be a team player, mm -hmm. an orchestrator in many ways, but also really, really understand the buying cycle of, or the, the buying behavior, I would say, and the logic behind that mm. from our target audience. Yeah. Uh, today, 60, 70% of the buying cycle of the time actually takes place when we are not interacting physically or in real life with our, yeah. with our prospects and customers. Yeah. So our team needs to work more digitally, mm. uh, be more adherent and observant and understanding the value that we drive mm. uh, during that, let's say first, period. Yeah. And once the sales teams get engaged from a pre-sales perspective, from a seller perspective, consultants are also part of that. Mm -hmm. They really need to pick up where, where, let's say, in the same, with the same messaging and position, his positioning that has been taking place during the first 60, 60% mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. That I think is the challenging part. Yeah. So that they are actually aligned with a you know, basic <clears> example of what is happening in marketing. You know, we're going out and telling a certain story about our product, the market, whatever. You know, when we go to a prospect meeting, we need to be able to speak to those things, right? Because yep. that might actually be what the prospect has seen, right? Uh, I have a great example of that from one of our customers who they sell to hospitals, mm -hmm. right? And in the past, they used to go to hospital and they had an hour of meeting and coffee and presentation yeah. and slides and so on. Now they go and they have 10 minutes, right? Because yep. the buyer has done all the research already. They know mm -hmm. the different products. They kind of know pricing and they kind of know distributions. They know all of the things already because they've seen it in other channels. And that means sales, they need to really, as you say, be a part of that team where, okay, they can be Slatan here, but there needs to be another team that does all the other work before it, right? Yeah, you cannot build a sales team of only Slatans. So no. uh, that's, that's for sure. Maybe certain. it would be fun, interesting at least. Well, <laughs> not in the long term. No. In the long term, maybe. Yeah. No, but the, uh, one thing that actually struck me when, uh, because we're talking about touch points here, we're talking about variable touch points, and everybody or many work also with, let's say, digital marketing, where yeah. how do you, let's say, build value throughout the, uh, uh, let's say, the buyer's journey? Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, those touch points are of high quality today in many ways, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that we have valid content uh, that is really relevant for our target audience. So uh, I, was, I was in the car to, to, this, uh, to our meeting here today, and I thought about, 
maybe not everybody, this kind of explains how old I am, but Jan Karlsson, the former CEO of Scandinavian Airlines. Yeah. He, yeah, he wrote a book that was called uh, Riv Pyramidena, Tear Down the Pyramids. Yeah. Uh, maybe a strange title, but uh, one thing that made him successful with Lini Flug and also SAS was that he looked at what are all the touch points, how do we deliver maximum value in mm. all the touch points that a traveler traveling with, an SA, with SAS mm. do, meaning check-in, yeah. baggage handling, uh, you know, boarding on the plane, et cetera. So, because he was really focusing on that customer interaction mm. and that kind of, you know, the, the handover from the various steps, I think that's super important yeah. with B2B sales today that everybody, that, that kind of brings back to the team aspect, that everybody's aware of what's the game plan, what's your role, what's mm. the message, what's the value, and who are we talking to and with, and what actually is required yeah. to, to be relevant. And um, that, I think, is one of the biggest developments and changes in the digital world around B2B sales today. And I think yeah. kind of yeah, exactly that. When I when it, when we look at kind of research of what are buyers doing, you know, clearly they're now spending less and less time actually meeting yeah. <laughs> with suppliers, which is tough, right? And that's the big mindset change, I think, where the SaaS story there, I think, it really ties into what we're trying to achieve. Because in the past, yeah, you had that one hour, that was maybe most of the sales journey covered in one meeting. But now we have a lot of small interactions, like we said, yeah. you're checking in your baggage. You're watching a webinar, you're doing things online, you're on LinkedIn, you're connecting, etc. So I think having that buyer journey mindset is a really strong starting point, right? Like instead of saying, okay, what are we trying to sell to people? How can we help people buy throughout that buyer journey, which might be very long and it is going to include a sales meeting, yeah. but might only be at the very end. Yeah. Uh, if we talk about, uh, I was thinking about the toolings. Are there any, mm -hmm. let's say, tools that are different today than before we talk about we talk in a digital world yeah what, what, exactly from your perspective what are the tools that you see you know enhance yeah. what we talked about just now? i think in general i think what is incredible with sales today is that you know so i come from a marketing background and about you know 10 15 years in marketing we started to get really tech and tool obsessed right you mm -hmm. know and every marketeer today spends time in CRM, analytics, uh, LinkedIn, ad platforms. They might have, you know, five to 10 technology platforms that help them do their work. And that's great, right? And I think the same thing is happening in sales now, yeah. right? That I think, again, if you went back five to 10 years, a lot of selling was still done in a very analog way. At some point, you had to maybe enter some information in CRM, but you didn't use it to become more effective. Yeah. It was kind of a reporting type thing. My manager tells me to put opportunities to CRM, I do it. Yeah. Right? Where I think the big thing that's happening to sales today is that they're thinking about how can technology make me more efficient so I can sell more effectively to more people at the same time. So of course that's CRM, right? But it's also using things like you know outreach platforms. LinkedIn is of mm -hmm. course a massive, massive driver for any B2B seller, right? Both in terms of classic outreach, but also in terms of how can I make a position for myself? How can I not be positioned as a salesperson, but as someone who's knowledgeable in my industry, who's an expert that you can ask things, right? I'm not just trying to sell you, uh, you know, some pencils and cups. I'm actually trying to help you achieve your goals. Right? Yeah. So I think for me, those are kind of the two things. One is how do I make my back end more efficient? Like mm -hmm. how do I spend less time building in, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, zero doing a bunch of manual work, how can I make that part more efficient so I can spend more time selling? And when I'm doing selling, how do I kind of transition from I'm doing one-to-one -one selling, like calling someone or emailing someone to sometimes also doing one-to-many, right? How can yeah. I actually expand my reach to more people at the same time? And yeah, of course, uh, you're right in the middle of this. So yeah, curious to, to hear a little bit about how, how does that actually play out? in the real world uh, when, you're, when you're implementing that? Uh, in the real world, just look at the way we, just look at the way, as I said, we are a good reference uh, to, our, uh, to our target audience as well. We see that if you're gonna, if you're gonna support the whole journey, meaning uh, mm -hmm. for, a, for a company that wants to reach out and sell to other businesses, if you have a product and a service, aftermarket service, yeah. uh, you really need to have a, a full 360 degree view on, on the client mm -hmm. with the data, meaning that you need to, know what kind of interactions do you have with them what have you sold to them what have you done all the activities and everything that goes on yeah 
in order to provide a good customer experience. Mm. Uh, because at the end of the day, you need to, as a sales rep, you need you need to you need to understand what is going on within mm -hmm. your clients yeah. uh, today. Even even if they are your existing customer or if you are to become customer, you need to have more information. So we see that information integration and gathering that in a in in a platform of some sort, mm -hmm. CRM. And being able to utilize that in the processes that you're working with is, is key. And processes is also another thing. It could be sometimes connected with negativity. But mm. to be honest, if we're working today with, uh, let's say, distributed sales teams, maybe geographically yeah. uh, and uh, in a very on-the-fly way that we do today, strong process support for your key processes when you, it comes to serving and selling to your clients is important. Mm. So for us, I think the... It's the combination of all the surrounding tools around social social platforms and whatnot, with the let's say the strong process support with a with a strong data platform as well yeah. in and around customer data. I think that's that's really really important. We saw that in the pandemic, the companies that didn't really have a, a stronghold on that mm. didn't succeed as good as others. Yeah. So being having a strong digital platform for your client data and the way you work and serve them. They came out better than the others. Yeah. So, uh, and we see that now in the aftermath that there's a strong digitalization movement mm. within those. That, that I think many people woke up at the time yeah. and said, "Well, we really need to we need to be stronger in that area." And how do you guys think about adoption? Because I think that's one of the things. Of course, we also help sometimes companies with that. Hey, we have all these great ideas about customer data platforms, and at some point, it relies on a human being maybe someone in sales, yeah. connecting the dots between what's happening on the product. Uh, I need to do some data entry still myself, even though we're doing it better. Yeah. And I need to work with these tools in a better way. And a lot of salespeople are on, a, let's say, a learning journey yeah. right, to make this happen. So and maybe an interesting question, like this whole area of adoption, what's kind of your experience on working with companies on, on that? I think adoption of from a usability perspective, you mean, or uh, for using the tools, right? Yeah. Being able to actually, you know, we have this great CRM, we have this great tools at hand. Let's use them, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think the uh, ease of use is extremely important today. Yeah. We've learned a lot from what has happened in the mobile industry, yeah. meaning that people today tend to buy business applications in the way they buy uh, a Samsung or an yeah. iPhone. You know, they yeah. they want that same user experience. Yeah. It should be easy to. We, a new a new platform, a new tool should not make life more cumbersome. And we mm. see that from our perspective when we talk to co companies that it's really high demand on, let's say, the user experience and mm. it should be very intuitive yeah. and whatnot, because that's that's where the bar is today. And yeah. we have also younger generations coming along yeah. here and their demands are even higher. Yeah. So, um, but I think the from a technology perspective, uh, the capabilities are there. It's just, yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of, you know, making sure that we, we really drive that digital arena uh, within our company as well, and mm -hmm. uh, ensure that we have people uh, enable people to be to be you know digital in the mm -hmm. way they they operate and work. Yeah. Uh, from a sales perspective, then, if we talk about um, uh, if we talk about trust, one thing that I came to to think about, Brian, when you talked about uh, you know what is developing and trust is something which is very important yes. within sales as well. When yeah. they when you when a sales rep steps into a room with a with a prospect or with a company, trust is something that we see at least is is important. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a really important factor that people buy from people today. Even yes. though we're so digital, Absolutely. people at the end of the day buy from people, and they buy from people that they trust. Yeah. And it's in order to build trust in a fairly short amount of time, where the first part of the time is also digital. Mm. It's a little bit. It's could be a little bit complex. Yeah. Uh, what kind of what should we tell companies when it comes to uh, how should they should I say, en enable or empower mm. their teams when it comes to uh, just to building trust to build trust and enforce yeah. that that part of the equation? Yeah, I guess two perspectives for me is like one, all of the great material that's already been written on like how to be a trusted advisor and the trust equation and so on. Like if you're into that sort of stuff, that that methodology and thinking it's still relevant like it's mm -hmm. still super relevant to build empathy mm -hmm. and to show uh, experience all of these things are still relevant i think the two things that i think are new for me is one it's sometimes possible now to do it at scale and of mm -hmm. course that's where social yeah. selling and putting yourself out there becomes 
a, a really meaningful thing because hey you're actually engaging with people before you meet them physically and that means they've seen you they know yeah. you they know your mannerisms and so on they kind of know a little bit about who you are so bringing yourself online i think is one of those things that enable trust because hey, I've, I've seen you before i, I know yeah. kind of how you work and um so i think that's that's a big thing and then the second thing about trust that at least i'm thinking a lot about now is is also acknowledging how much the buyer knows yeah. right? and because that for me also generates a lot of trust that i know that you're not a complete stranger to this industry you know the industry you might actually know more than me in many many areas yeah. and like the most it was, it was something we discussed uh, recently is for example openly discussing competitors is one yeah. of my favorite things yeah. like when you step into that meeting i know that you know this industry so you know who are the competitors in this space and you're trying to learn from me right what are the actual differences between these competitors and that's where by being a little bit vulnerable and acknowledging yes lots of players i know them too and you know them let's together work on what are the actual differences and what's relevant for your company whereas i think that's where in the in the past sometimes you could be a little bit protective right yeah. and <clears throat> and for me that's something that kills trust right when 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 the seller doesn't acknowledge that the buyer knows a lot, right? Yeah. So respecting the buyer, I think, goes a long way to building that trust. Yeah, and I think the it's kind of that you that you just mentioned that scenario because we I had a conversation with a client the other day and uh, uh, it was just that we could we talked about the the difficulties in and around CRM is a CRM is a difficult area. Being yes. a buyer within the CRM yeah, area today is is not easy. No. There is, there is a lot of vendors there, and we you really need to pick out who who does fit yes. me as, yes. as, as a client. And uh, for us as a vendor, we need to be super clear yeah. on who are we, yeah. you know, and who are you not? Who yeah. are we yeah, not exactly. specifically? And that that shines through uh, super clear. And I think it's it's really important that we have the uh, I would say the the courage mm -hmm. to go into that conversation because exactly. really we we do not. If we look at SuperOffice, we we stand for long long lasting customer relationships, and the customers stay with SuperOffice for a long time. Mm. And um, for us, it's important to have the the skills and also the uh, the courage to have that conversation right yeah. up front. Yeah, because the, also the prospects and the customers demand that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, anything else we could talk about here? Um, sales and marketing collaboration. You said, Brian, that you came from marketing. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that we drive heavily within SuperOffice today is how do we get the sales team and the, and the marketing, both from a central perspective, but also from a field marketing perspective yeah. to you know, interlock? Yeah, you're absolutely, it's a great topic, right? And again, coming from marketing, you know, you kind of go through this phase of being a little bit mad at sales, right? <laughs> you're a little bit tired of, oh, why don't these guys fill in CRM? Yeah. Why don't they do what I say? And so on and so forth. And then at some point, you kind of you know, internalize that hey, they're not actually bad people, right? We're just different people looking at the same topic in a different way. So are we, we tend to say like there's, a, there's kind of three things that are needed for that strong marketing and sales collaboration that are relevant for any relationship actually, right? Uh, and uh, there's a little bit of marriage counseling here as well, right? And, and the first one is that empathy, right? Mm -hmm. That as a marketeer, I understand that you are great at some things that I am not, right? And that just common empathy of saying, yeah, we kind of, we're trying to achieve the same thing, but we're great at different things and really understanding that. And I think many marketeers, to be honest, have been kind of stuck in a sales are stupid, honesty yeah. type of thinking and super unfortunate and maybe the same vice mm -hmm. versa. So strong empathy is one thing, right? And then of course, there's the second part, which is uh, then, um, okay, we need to have a common vision and strategy. And that's of course, sometimes where uh, you know, there can be a little bit of misalignment, right, between what is the sales department trying to do in terms of short term closing customers and so on, where sometimes marketing is on a different path, right, looking at different verticals or trying to achieve different things and so on. So that's got to be there, right? And again, if we were in a relationship, it would be, where do we live? How many kids do we have? Where do we go on holiday? So those type of things, even though we're different, we need to agree. And then the last thing that we always speak to is joint initiatives. And again, if a relationship is like, we got to do things together because otherwise yeah. we won't like each other. And it's the same thing in sales and marketing. Let's find some of those initiatives where we work together, 
we're active together. We do things in a joint way. We do joint planning, joint target setting, all of those things. So yeah. it's so crucial. And as you said, as we started, it's never been more important than now when marketing owns, let's say, a bigger portion of that yeah. sales uh, journey. Yeah. I think also the um, understand where we come from because sales organizations, B2B sales organizations, typically are a little bit nearsighted yeah. or short term. Yeah. Whereas marketing, in many ways, you know, you have a long game kind of agenda in terms of yeah. awareness and and, uh, and branding yeah. and let's say positioning. Yes. Whereas uh, B2B or, uh, sales organization might want to say we need leads yeah. in, a, in a very short term. Yeah. And you find that balance within with activities on the short term and the long term. I think it's important to understand that. Yeah. Uh, also, I think the that you have a, a common view on the positioning and the messaging. This yes. is something that we work a lot with yeah. and something that companies should, I think, work with on a more or less on an annual basis or whatnot, Absolutely. at least on a periodic yes. basis in terms of positioning for whom, for who, we are, who, for who do you really mean a lot? Mm. And how do you message that? How do you reach out to them yeah. and understand, communicate with that, with that group of prospects and customers? And that we have a common view within sales and marketing and across the board in the company mm. that these these are our target audience because segmentations of the uh, to understand let's say your target audience is one of the first starting points when yeah. it comes to uh, let's say establish that collaboration. So um, some word of advice then if we're going to conclude we talked a little bit here about various topics within B two B sales and how you build the teams but we're just going to sum it up somewhat uh, yeah. a few words of advice for our listeners here on the webinar absolutely so i guess you know we talked a little bit about okay why is it important now and that's because yeah sellers are challenged buyers are getting smarter journeys are becoming longer more informed etc so that's kind of the yeah. why are we here right and then i think okay what can we actually do let's start at the end right strong marketing and sales collaboration for me is one of them right that is a lever to get better results out of funny enough both teams actually and then I think from a sales, let's say, organization perspective, then our discussion around thinking as a sales team yes. and not as a team of sellers, I think that's a major mind shift change of, yeah, we can't all be slatins. Somebody has to pay support. Somebody has to uh, score the goals and somebody has to keep goals from going in. So I think that would be the second thing for me, right? Really strongly interrogating how do I organize, structure, compensate, set goals for sales that enable it to be a team and not 10 lone wolves all chasing their own yeah. business. And then I think the third thing is also leaning into, let's say, modern sales and marketing, whether that's tools, right? Or whether that's, uh, let's say, social selling, all of these abilities that digital channels and so on give us so that all the things that's happening out there of buyers self-educating, that has mm -hmm. to be a strength and not a threat, right? It has to be a strength that all buyers are self-educating. That's fantastic. Yeah. Then I can get in front of them before we have our meeting. So when we have our meeting, they already know me. That's great, right? Yeah. So I think leaning into what's happening there as an opportunity and as a strength, I think, yeah, I think there would be those three things top yeah. of my mind. Yeah, uh, very good comments. And I just want to round off with, uh, if we're just going to talk about sales and sales individuals, to me, being a value driver, mm -hmm. you know, striving to be a value driver in your domain if that is a vertical or if that is a subdomain of a vertical or if that is wherever that now might be, uh, really need to take ownership of how do you become a value driver within that domain. That is hard, mm -hmm. but it requires a, a large degree of interest. You really need to be concerned about the well-being of your clients and prospects. I think that's, if you're not, you need to get, you need to get your arms around that yeah. because that I think that's what the expectation level is out there. And this is about change. You know, the what is changing outside the window here is it's it's the world is in constant change and it's, it has never the pace has never been as slow as it is today. So it will only go faster. Mm. Scary enough, but uh, you need to feel comfort also in the in change within this. So how you work, how you acquire personnel into your, to your sales teams, how you develop them, and how you coach them in order to work as a team player, uh, because selling is a team sport. Is something that really is something you need to work with on a daily basis from an individual perspective from a management perspective and from a corporate perspective so uh, in order to be successful out there because it's super exciting what is going, going on right now but it, and it's yeah all the capabilities are out there so it's a fun time to be working Absolutely. within b2b sales Absolutely. 
So answering the first question then, uh, will the B2B sales time survive the future? I say yes. Absolutely. If you pick up some of the points that me and Brian have talked about today, maybe. Absolutely, yeah. It's never been a better time to be a seller if you're good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian, thanks a lot for Thank stopping you. by Thank and to have this conversation. And uh, audience, feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat now. So uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you.